The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with Episode 11 of Viewpoint. And I am joined this evening with our producer and director of programming for BaseNet Television, Ed Jupin. Ed, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Tony. I guess uh, we're looking into winding down pretty much our primary coverage here, and uh, we'll be looking forward to bigger and better things. That's absolutely true. I wouldn't say this is the complete end of our primary coverage, but I'm predicting that you're going to see a shift in our format in the next couple of weeks because the results from the April 3rd primaries, Wisconsin, D.C., and Maryland, were in a lot of ways not very interesting. I think an indication of what's to come. I'm willing to predict at this point that Mitt Romney has won the nomination and will win the nomination. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's why as we're going to go to our next few episodes, you're going to see us focusing more on news and politics in general as we did towards the beginning and more on the general election. Whereas prior to this, we've only really sort of peripherally mentioned the president and his policies and what's going on. Uh, we focus more on the differences between these candidates. But although I don't want to write anyone out, especially Ron Paul, uh, write anyone off, I should say, I think we're moving into general election mode. Sure, because on uh, April 3rd, President Obama also secured his nomination. Uh, as of primary night on April 3rd, he had enough delegates to secure the Democratic nomination. So that's well, wrapped up. Let's hope so. They were predicting he'd have a uh, you know a billion dollars in fundraising for his campaign this uh, election cycle. And <laughs> I hope he gets the happening. nomination. Yeah. Now, now maybe he's got his nomination. They can finally start meeting their uh, their obligations. But before we go into the uh, results of these three states, you know, I've said before that a long primary season is good for democracy and it's good for the party. And I know last episode I made the point just to recap everyone that you know people have said this is a weak Republican field, and my argument is that it's actually a strong field. What do you define a strong versus a weak field? Is a strong field where one candidate is just the person that everyone goes for? I don't know. Maybe that's strong for the establishment, but is that really a strong field of candidates when everyone's like, well, this is the one person we want? I consider that a weak field because there's nobody else running and it's, well, we've just got to go with this person. A strong field is you've got a lot of different good candidates with a lot to bring to it. I mean, think, think of you're hiring a manager for your business. What do you want? Yeah, you'd like that one great CEO, but if you get 10 great applicants, that's a strong field of candidates. If you get five applicants, if you get, you know, three applicants and only one of them's decent, that's not a strong field. Even if that one person knocks it out of the park, you're like, hey, why did we get the one person who's, you know, really well qualified for that? So I think we need to redefine what we consider a strong field versus a weak field. The other comment, uh, listening to Rick Santorum's speech on April 3rd, his uh, concession speech, if you will, he brought up a good point. Half the states and half the delegates have yet to be counted. And I think that's very interesting when you really start to think about it. That we Yeah, he said that we're only at halftime tonight. It's really interesting when you think about it. We're so ready to just cancel this, to finish it, to be done with it. I mean, we're doing it here at BaseNet, but I mean, the country as a whole is up. We're over halfway through an election. I think these primaries have to be, I don't know, there's got to be something done ahead of time. Maybe the conventions need to be earlier, or maybe they need two conventions is what they need. Because the conventions in the modern sense, and I've said this before, are really just coronations. Maybe they need a convention and a coronation. I think, in Iowa and New Hampshire would hate me, but I think you do all the primaries, all on the same day, see where the numbers roll, and fight it out at the convention. Will that ever happen? Probably not. But I can dream. A man can dream, can't he? That's not a bad theory. You have the general election on the same day, so why not have primaries on the same that's day? That's true. I mean, I, you know, that's a very have good point. Have a primary I mean, day and a general election day. Could you imagine if presidential election was a, a process of the two candidates going head-to-head -head in Iowa and then going head-to-head -head in New Hampshire and then going head-to-head -head in South Carolina yep. and then this state. And I mean, it's, it's really outrageous when you think about it. And I don't want to knock the small states. It really gives them a chance to have influence in the national election that they otherwise would not have. But on the other hand, we've just got to do something different with this because it's not fair to call the race it after you know half the states have voted, uh, especially in a primary. But that's my view. That's the, uh, that's the viewpoint view, so to speak. We're going to go on and look at some of these results. And I guess the most interesting results came from uh, Washington, D.C., which I think at last count had it was, what, about 3,500 or 4,000 people voting? Yes. Uh, some horribly low number, which is embarrassing in and of itself. I mean, D.C. is a 
fairly sizable city. You'd hope there'd be four, more than 4,000 registered Republicans voting. But they all seem to be, in my opinion, they would be Romney voters, and the numbers certainly pan that out. Romney won 70% in D.C. Mind you, Rick Santorum wasn't actually on the ballot in D.C., no. so that's something to consider, too. Very interesting that without him being there, he won 70%, because Gingrich and Paul were virtually tied at 11 and 12%, and we're talking about five or 600 votes here. Interesting, again, that Gingrich did not seem to pick up that missing Santorum vote that you'd expect to have been there. It went entirely to Romney. John Huntsman managed to pull off 7% in D.C. Don't really know what that is, although I will say this, and, and you know, this is a little critical, but, uh, you know, it's my show. I can say what I want. There's a lot of rhinos out there who like John Huntsman, and by rhinos, I mean Republicans in name only. A lot of these moderate business, class, you know, business country club Republicans that are like, oh, we like John Huntsman. There are also a lot of Democrats that say they like John Huntsman because they think he's kind of one of them, and he probably is. Now, that's not to knock John Huntsman. I'm actually a very big fan of John Huntsman. But I think they're those people who are, oh, well, let's pick somebody that the Democrats will like. Whereas I'm like, no, let's pick somebody the Democrats will not like. But that's just me. But yeah, so Huntsman came out of nowhere, won 7%. Maybe he dropped too, too soon. He should have followed the Gingrich model. But again, the only interesting thing about that, Romney, 70%. I mean, that goes to show that when Santorum, Santorum supporters up there aren't there, they're not going to Gingrich like Gingrich in his whack job ways think they are. Maryland and Wisconsin both came out very similar, but there's two important things to note. Wisconsin, Romney did win, 42 to 38, Romney to Santorum. Paul came in with 12. I think there was some other bastard running who came in with six, but I didn't bother reading all the way down to the bottom of the page. Again, interesting that Romney did win Wisconsin, good heartland state. And only he was by, behind about a week or two ago. Yeah, only about 4% he won it by, so again, not a resounding... No, victory, but again, but he, he was behind a week or two ago. So that's true, and he does seem to come, come towards the end. And, you know, I think that's an important thing to know, because when we get to the general election, people are going to want to look at the polls, and two weeks before the election, they're going to say, well, the election's done. Obama's up four points, you know, you, that, it is what it is. And I always hate when people do that. I don't like exit polling, I'll also tell you. A friend of mine was talking to me this afternoon, uh, the afternoon of the primary, rather, on Tuesday, and he says, oh, you know, have you paid attention to the exit polls yet? I said, no, I don't like exit polls. I don't like them one little bit. I like to wait until the polls have closed and then to watch numbers come in. I hate instant projections. I don't care how good it looks. I really, really don't like it. Maybe it's because I appreciate the theater that is politics and the theater that is elections, but we're so keen to want to just boil these down and, and almost make them not count, and it's dangerous. It's the media that's doing it. It's us that's feeding the media. But again, here's one of those things where I'm going to throw this out there and say that's dangerous for democracy that, you know, we're doing that, that we want these to just be over quick and we just, what's the quick number? Let's make that judgment and let's move on. I mean, it's not supposed to be a gamble. It's supposed to be a factual resolution of an election. We saw in 2000, you never want to call things too early. I think the media learned that then. They were very, very conservative about it for a while. And now they've jumped back into, well, we just want to spout off whatever we want. But again, I digress. A little bit of a uh, diversion there. Sorry about that. But Wisconsin, nothing really spectacular. Romney did win. Again, Paul pulling at 12%. He is still in there. He has not dropped off the face of the earth. And again, I said I think there was some other bastard who pulled around 6%. Now, Maryland, a little bit more interesting for a couple of reasons. Romney came in at 48%. Uh, Santorum came in at 30 Paul and the other bastard there were tied at 10 and 11%. Why is Maryland interesting? I will let you know as soon as I pull up some information. But Maryland, let's look at where it is, right on the outside of D.C. So it's interesting to know maybe if Santorum hadn't been there, maybe Romney would have won Maryland the same way that he won D.C. And but D.C. is in the Maryland um, television market. So any and all negative ads that are shown on television – are shown in the Maryland market, which is covered in D.C. Exactly. So, so you have the same television audience in D.C. and Maryland, such as like New York and New Jersey, who are all in the New York area. Right. That's absolutely right. New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, sorry, uh, I got New Jersey on the brain all of a sudden. Maryland is a northeastern state, although, again, I want to clarify, when you come from Boston, it's considered the south. I think Newark is the Mason-Dixon line for us up here in Boston. It's a East Coast, Northeastern, liberal, elitist, Republican, whatever Mitt Romney gets uh, knocked for being state. And I think the thing with Maryland is Maryland's going to be very similar to how the rest of these Northeastern states, uh, these you know elitist states, whatever you want to call them. I mean, I'm from one of them, how they're going to vote. And that's where we're going to come to the formal end of this primary. And I said it last time, and I'm going to say it again, April 24th, Rick's uh, Santorum's last stand, Connecticut, Delaware, Rhode Island, 
New York. The kind of Republicans they vote for are the same kind of Republicans that people in Maryland are going to vote for. And that kind of Republican is Mitt Romney. There's one other state on April 24th, Pennsylvania, which could go either way. Being Santorum's home state, he has a very strong chance he to should win get, But again, as we've said many times over the course of this primary season, when he was voted out as senator, he lost by 18 points. He did. So he's won big and he's lost big. My prediction, I'm willing to make an official prediction here. I think he's going to get it. He is. I, I'm almost certain of it. Romney is going to win Rhode Island. He's going to win New York. He's going to win Delaware. And he's going to win Connecticut. Which, to be honest with you, other than New York, there's not that many uh, delegates no, available. New York, other New, side. York's the big one. New York and yep. Pennsylvania are the big two of that day. Santorum is going to win Pennsylvania, and that's going to be when he bows out. Because it makes sense. I mean, it's perfect, perfect end. I mean, obviously the perfect end to Santorum's career would be winning the uh, nomination of the presidency. But it's a great end for him. He finishes strong. He finishes in his home state with hopefully a victory in his home state. And he's able to go out when he wants to go out. When really, if anyone were to ask you right now, even though it's Romney's nomination, who is the battle between the last men standing are Romney and Santorum? And, and although Paul's going to stick it through, and I've got my crazy predictions about what he's going to do once Carolina, uh, California and Texas and all that come in, but really Rick Santorum can go home with his head held high knowing and he well, was the last And well, to stick up for tenth. Santorum on the night of April 3rd primary, in his concession speech that you had mentioned earlier, he uh, did say that... He anticipates winning Pennsylvania, and as long as he wins Pennsylvania, now every, everything could change almost right from the horse's mouth should he lose Pennsylvania. But he said that if he wins Pennsylvania, it's on to Texas, and he expects to win Texas. And then he's starting to see his snowball numbers where he's just in this dream, this daydream of the numbers going in his favor all of a sudden, even with Pennsylvania and Texas. Yeah, which I, I don't think – I mean, if you were to win Pennsylvania, that's 72. Texas is 155, so there's 200 delegates right there. And then if you add California to that, you're now up to close to 400 delegates. Plus, he'll probably possibly win Arkansas and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But what does that put him up with? He might be at six or 700 delegates. I mean, so he's really going to cause – And Romney will be ahead of that at that point because Romney right. right now is at almost 700. Right, and I don't think that's necessarily going to happen because... And I don't Santorum believe those are all winner-take-all states either. The re re keep in mind, as we found out, the Republican Party has changed almost all of the states. They're no longer winner-take-all states. So, right, that's so that, I mean, Romney that, that, just needs that little... You know, he's, he's just so far ahead that as long as it's not winner-take-all, he's going to get something, and that's just going to keep him that much further ahead. Right, and I mean, if you look at it tonight, I think Romney picked up probably close between 80 and 100 delegates. We'll have to wait and see what the final count is. And I think April 24th, Romney's can probably end up picking up a minimum of 100. We're probably looking at the bare minimum being 110, 120. Could go up as high as 200 delegates, depending on how Pennsylvania goes. Just too far ahead. Absolutely. I mean, there's a 100 and let me see. I'll do the math for you guys real quick here. 20 in Rhode Island, and I'm rounding here. 20 in Delaware, we're at 40. Throw Connecticut in at 30, you're at 70, and then add New York to that. We'll say you're at 160 with New York's 1 to 5, and then 72 for Pennsylvania. So you're pretty much looking at Romney picking at least 150 delegates up to Santorum. You're looking at absolute max of 100, and I think that's giving Santorum an exceptional night. Right, and um, Romney already has about a 400-delegate lead. Exactly. So all that's going to happen is Romney's lead's going to grow. And I think Santorum will realize that. I mean, yeah. you got to understand politics. He can't say, oh, well, I'm going to bow out after uh, – Hey, our, <laughs> our, buddy, our buddy Newt finally saw it our way after our last episode where we called him a couple nice choice names. Newt's basically gone. Uh, it was like a day or two later after our last show – that he announced that he was laying off all of that staff and pretty much threw it in. Yeah, you know, my guess is he's he's looking to carry it to the convention. I think he so, listens to BaseNet. Uh, I, he probably does. You know, you know, I'll give him credit. Newt is a very intelligent man. So, so he probably does listen to BaseNet. He probably does listen to BaseNet, does listen to BaseNet so I'll give him credit for that. My guess is he's probably trying to take it to the convention so he can get into a couple of news cycles so he can probably sell a couple more books or something. I mean, there's some other motive of uh, of Gingrich's here that he wants to do. I mean, maybe every time he gets on TV and he talks about how horrible he lost, he realizes he sells a couple more books. You know, somebody goes on to Amazon and buys three or four copies of his books. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I mean, I think Newt's obviously weaving over this. He's obviously out. Yeah. But he realizes where he's going. He probably listened to BaseNet and decided 
if we said it here in base net, it's got to be true. But I think as for his, you know, not bowing out, he's just going to become less and less relevant than he already is, if you can believe that. And he's probably just doing it so at the convention he can, you know, get to give a speech or something like that because he probably just wants to feel important. Which, again, Newt could be hands down the winner right now if he just wasn't such an asshole. Simple as that. There is no other scientific, uh, less scientific way to describe it than that. The most quantitative term to describe why Newt Gingrich didn't win is that he's an asshole oh i like our term better douchebag that's true douchebag i think works as well he, he's out but anyway as i said april 24th that's gonna happen may 8th i mean is santorum gonna really stick it out he's got north carolina west virginia and indiana sure is there a potential that he could do well there but again what santorum has seen and if he has half a brain and he does he's a smart guy is that nowhere where he's expected to do well has he really done well Hypothetically, April, May 8th, this won't happen. If he won those three states with 90% of the vote each, yes, it's on. But it's not going to happen. Even if Santorum won all three states, it would be a Santorum 48, Romney 42. And that's not the kind of sweeping victory. And I think Santorum no, not realized... With, not with the uh, proportional now. If it was winner take all, that's different. But with exactly. proportional now, and unless you win, like you just said, 90% of the vote, if it's 43-38 in his favor... Santorum's favor, that's not significant enough for the proportional delegates to put him ahead of Romney. Right. Not to mention, I mean, does he have potential in Texas? Sure, but he's going to be splitting that vote somewhat with Romney because remember, some of the cities. And Newt, who remember months ago, two months ago, predicted he's going to win Texas. Yeah, everyone's predicting they're going to win Texas. Watch, watch John Huntsman win Texas. Watch Rick Perry win <laughs> yeah. Texas. Yeah. You know, but that's it. I guess you could see potentially if they're all still in the race, you could see a small surge from Newt in Texas. Romney's still going to get his core group. Yeah, Santorum might do well, but Paul will probably do better in Texas than he would elsewhere. So nobody's going to sweep Texas. With Santorum and Gingrich out, Romney will do better in Texas. I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I mean, Romney's not going to win it that well, but Santorum's not going to be able to win Texas unless something dramatic changes. But you know what? The chance for that dramatic change, that dramatic... 11th hour moment where the campaign starts going in a different direction, it's come and it's gone. And it hasn't happened. It didn't happen for Newt. It didn't happen for Santorum. If Herman Cain had not been forced out of the race by illegal and unfounded accusations, Herman Cain would have swept the South. Herman Cain would probably be beating Romney right now, and he could win Texas and California. But unfortunately, Herman Cain bowed out, so we're now left with Mitt Romney, who, by the way, a week after Texas, do you like my little plug for Herman Cain there? <laughs> the Herman you you Cain get that in every show somehow. The Herman Cain train is still going strong. Yes, Texas is May 29th, but a week later is a big primary day. Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, South Dakota, and California with 172 delegates. Let's face it, Rick Santorum, not going to win California. Ron Paul, pick up a couple votes in California. Newt Gingrich, not going to do well in California. He's just not well-liked. Mitt Romney is a California-style Republican. Those rich, wealthy, Orange County Republicans are going to love, and they are going to drool, and they are going to cream themselves over Mitt Romney. So, unfortunately, I guess that's what makes BaseNet now mainstream media. And I think you just threw enough facts out there as to why we're calling it. I wasn't calling it six months ago because it wasn't decided six months ago. We're finally calling it because it looks like... It's undeniable. Like... Exactly. I mean, again, anything can happen in politics. Mitt Romney, I don't think he's made many errors in this campaign, but the media are jumping on everything and trying to make it like an error. The Etch-a-Sketch thing, and I can't wait till we start getting into our general election discussion so we can go more after this. Uh, go more into this, but, you know, that Etch-a-Sketch comment, what the individual from Romney's campaign meant, not that Romney just changes everything he does and becomes Etch-a-Sketch, you do sort of reset when you go into a general election. Anyone who remotely understands politics, especially presidential politics, and by remotely I mean understands them at a ninth grade level, is that candidates play to their bases and then they move towards the center for a general election. Now, if you're upset by that Etch-a-Sketch comment, it means you do not understand that, which means you are an idiot. Scientifically proven, quantitatively proven right now on Viewpoint that you're an idiot. That's how the elections work. Does it mean that Mitt Romney is the Teflon Don and he's going to change all his views and all of a sudden nothing he said matter? No, people don't pay attention to what was said in the primaries in a general election. 
it just doesn't happen. I mean, unless somebody makes some awful gaffe, mm -hmm. Mitt Romney is going to be arguing and debating with President Obama over what to do in Iran, over what to do with the economy, over what to do with Obamacare, whatever happens with that, what's going on in Europe. You How know, we ironically enough, we're not going to remember anything about Obama, uh, about Romney or Santorum or anything from the primaries. All we're going to remember from the primaries is Rick Herman Perry uh, and Rick Perry saying, oops. Yeah, exactly. That's all we're going to remember. You know, they're going to say, who had their Rick Perry moment? But, you know, when, when Mitt Romney and Barack Obama are going back and forth on education or on, on defense, whatever it happens to be, nobody's going to be like, well, in a Republican debate and, you know, or one of the primaries, you know, Mitt Romney said this, well, Santorum comes with this, while Paul came with Not going to happen at all. So those of you who are upset about the Etch a Sketch comment, none of you listening to this show are upset about that because we know you're all brilliant, intelligent listeners, and you would understand that comment. But it just frustrates me when everyone jumps on stuff like that. I guess I'll call Mitt Romney the Teflon Don. They are trying to get stuff to stick to mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, and it's just not happening. And you know what? Gingrich has tried. Santorum has tried. The media has tried. And all the media, although they're trying to attack Romney, they also want Romney. I think they want him as the general election candidate. Uh, you know, maybe he's more, I don't know, more entertaining to them. Maybe they think that if he gets elected, he'd be slightly better than somebody like a Gingrich or a Santorum, whatever their reason is. But they're not even getting anything to stick on him. Well, absolutely. Gingrich positively 100% despises the media. Right. So the media wouldn't want to follow Gingrich around. As, exactly, as well he should. But I mean, if you also look at it, there's the issue of, you know, Mitt Romney in this, the uh, the dog and how he tied the family dog to the car. Mm -hmm. I mean, in reality, is that a big issue? No. If you're making your presidential decisions based on that, that's awful. And you really just shouldn't. But they keep trying to get it to stick and they're trying to get a whole movement out of it. And it's just not happening. It could say that Mitt Romney has no substance. I don't think that's the case. I think he's just a very intelligent guy. He's smart. Does he not do things controversial? No, he's intelligent. And once again, I've said this before, and I will say this until the day I die, Mitt Romney was a Republican in Massachusetts. A Democratic state. No, 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 no. This is not a Democratic state. <laughs> this is a... Beyond this, Massachusetts is a progressive state. We're a far left state. Mm -hmm. Even within that, the politics of the state are very different from any other state in the country. It's very weird. It's very different. It sure is. They're, you know, I mean, we, again, very, very progressive, very little to no remote conservatism. I personally, Massachusetts, grew up on the South Shore, which is the more conservative part of the state. And by more conservative, I mean they're your country club Republicans because it's the wealthier part of the state. You go out into Western Mass all far left loonies, the North Shore working class Democrats, the city in the, su in the immediate suburbs, all very progressive. Yeah. The Cape, all very wealthy liberal uh, progressives. The South Coast where you got the cities, Fall River, New Bedford and whatnot, all big blue towns, blue states. You know, it's not really red as much as it is pink, but people don't understand that. So when they say that he has no substance, it's just that he's intelligent. He's not going to get up there and start a debate on abortion in Massachusetts. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So a lot doesn't stick to Mick Romney because I think he's smart enough not to step in the shit. Not a lot of politicians do that, but what can you do? That's Mitt Romney, and I think that that's why he's won these contests. Some people think he's great to go up against Obama. Some people think he's not great to go up against Obama. Mitt Romney's a smart guy. He looks presidential. I mean, we've been over this before. I don't want to distract from our discussion of these primaries and where things are going with them. But I think that's why Mitt Romney has stayed Consistent, And there's something to be said about that. And we've talked before about how Romney doesn't seem to be breaking his bridge, his 25, his 30 percent. You know, he's gone up a little bit as more candidates have dropped. But that means there's some consistency there. Sure. And we've I talked about consistency a lot. We've talked a, we've talked about Ron Paul's consistency at his 9 to 11 percent. Exactly. And, you know, that means that voters see something in him and that they're sticking with him and that they're willing to go to Romney. We've all talked before about how, you know, Romney hasn't had his surge. But going back to what we said about uh, coordinating him, so to speak, as the nominee, I think it's going to happen because if you look at it, Mitt Romney's pretty much won this contest. And again, I hate doing that halfway through, but there's very few contenders left. And I think that's ultimately how you've got to look at it. He's built up a big enough lead to... Just exactly. And I think that's, that's, a, and I've said this, that's a good victory. I mean, that's a solid victory. If somebody comes out and they win Iowa and then they win New Hampshire and then they win South Carolina and then, oh, yeah, they won Super Tuesday... You get the impression like, well, I mean, was it really a victory or how much of that was just, uh, you know, just the hype and just, the, oh, well, this is the person we're supposed to vote for. Oh, this is the most popular person. Boy, our trifecta Tuesday seems like an ages ago, doesn't it? 
it does. It was a different world back then, which is funny to think of it that way. But I mean, it, it's it's really a victory in a true sense. Again, if Ted Kennedy wins in his, uh, you know, he won his last Senate election before he died, thank God. Is that a victory? Eh, it's a win, but it's not really an earned victory. And I think that's what Mitt Romney has here. He is slouted out and he has punched it out and he's gone forward. I know the Obama campaign is now once again, and they were early on, starting to focus more on Romney. Yeah, they're naming they're, him by name now. Right, because now they're convinced once again that he's the nominee. Mitt Romney, if you go back to the earliest debates over last summer, Mitt Romney, which I can't believe it's almost been a year since I discovered Herman Cain. I'm going to have to celebrate that occasion. <laughs> Mitt Romney started his campaign against Obama, and he's still going against it. And maybe that was a smart political move on his part to not try to tear down his opponents and to try to just go after the president. And, he, you know, the other candidates have come in and saw that. But again, it's tough when, uh, come in and said that. But it's tough when you're on the stage and you're up there. You've got to fight. You've got to try to beat these people. You are trying to beat them in an election, even though you tend to agree with things, uh, agree with the majority of what they say. But I think that's ultimately what it is, is Mitt Romney made the smart choice to focus more on the president. I wonder if that's going to have an impact on primaries in the future. I wonder if candidates are going to say, hey, we need to take the Romney strategy of trying to just attack the person on the other side. Now, if you've got two parties running at the same time, that's obviously more of an issue. With an incumbent, it's much easier. But it's actually a very intelligent strategy when you think about it. Furthermore, just to close out our discussion on Romney and, and briefly on winning these primaries, the evangelicals in the Tea Party will come around to Mitt Romney because I can assure you their dislike of... To not voting for Obama. Yeah, it, it's deep enough that they're going to come around, and the idea that they can kick Obama out, I think, is going to be a really, really big mo uh, motivator, especially as they start to see moderates and you know some Democrats, some independents, whatever you want to call them, come around to Romney, because I think that's what's going to happen, and you're seeing that. Well, I have to bring up Sarah Palin for a minute. She, this past week, as we're recording this show, hosted or co-hosted an episode of the Today Show on NBC, and in that, she did not throw her support, but when pushed by Ann Curry for more of an explanation, well, you know, why aren't you supporting the presumptive nominee just coming out and supporting Romney at this point? She says, because I'm one of those anybody but Obamas. And right. you're and there, gonna see an awful lot of that, anybody oh, yeah. but Obama. Absolutely, you know, I also think with Sarah Palin, and I'm, a, I'm a defender of Sarah Palin in a lot of ways. We'll have to have a separate episode to go into all the reasons why. But she's one of those people that is a media celebrity. And that's the way it is in the world of politics. And it's unfortunate, but she's a media celebrity. And as opposed to a regular celebrity, what she says has value because everyone wants to seem to know what Sarah Palin is, you know, is all about and what she's saying. Does her input, should I say, have much uh, value or much weight, I should say? I don't think so, but I think she hit the nail right on the head. She's in anybody but Obama people. And there's Too bad she's not a progressive. We'd get her as your co-host. We absolutely would. But, you know, uh, the, the, a funny little note here about the left, and to my liberal friends out there, I tell you this all the time. And I hate to give you help. I hate to help the left and teach you guys things that will ultimately help you, but you just don't seem to want to learn. The left has this deep-seated hatred for Sarah Palin. Let me point something out to you. The reason Sarah Palin is so loaded right now and is on talk shows and will be part of the American political spectrum for the next 20 or 30 years is because of the left. Because you couldn't leave well enough alone you had to tear her down, you had to attack her, you had to show so much disgust for her, and even after John McCain lost in 2008, there were so many lawsuits against Sarah Palin, totally unfounded, they forced her out of the governorship in Alaska because there were so many bogus lawsuits going after her for everything just to try to clog up her daily, what she had to do during the day and just to try to force her out of office. You made Sarah Palin what she is. You put Sarah Palin on the pedestal she is, and she's not going to go anywhere mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Same thing about Rush Limbaugh. The reason Rush Limbaugh is still popular today, every now and then when nobody's heard about him for a while, you people on the left, you people, you heard me say that, drum up some stupid thing that he said, and I'm a fan of Rush, and then you put it out there and you make a big deal about it and you make a controversy about it. Let me tell you something. The only time... Rush Limbaugh comes up in the news is when the left is complaining about him. If you shut your mouth and stop complaining about him, eventually he'd go away. Same thing with Sarah Palin. You had to mock her. You had to put her out there. You had to talk had about her. Had to put her on Saturday Night Live. Had to put her on Saturday Night Live. And now she will be with you 
for the next 20 or 30 years. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, hippies. You're your own worst enemy. Far be it me. I want to clarify again to everyone to help the left. You people need to realize what you're doing. You make these people out that you can't seem to, to stand. And ultimately, people round up and, and rally behind people like Sarah Palin and Rush Limbaugh because they don't like the fact that you're attacking them. And they don't like the fact that you're going after them. If you just stop doing it and stop playing these petty political games that people on the left play, I'm getting a little partisan here, where you're trying to destroy these right-wing figures, talking heads, whatever they are, if you stop trying to destroy people personally, you'd stop accidentally building people up personally and making them into what you hate. So there's a little free advice for the left from a guy from the right. You are your own worst enemy. I said it earlier about the Occupy Wall Street protests. Those of you on the left, those of you who are progressives, as you know, Occupy gears back up. I don't think anything's going to happen. Let me tell you something. The more they're raging against innocent cops who are doing nothing, the more you're just going to piss people off and you're just going to be some radical group. You're not going to have some great revolution where millions of people are running into the streets and supporting you. It's not going to happen. I understand you're frustrated with politics and you're frustrated with the way the country is, but let's face it. Raging against cops who care more about their pensions and going home to their wives and what's on TV than pressing you, it's not going to help anybody. Hey, when I, all they wanted to bitch about was the $5, the proposed $5 debit card fee from Bank of America, they were on to something. But then <laughs> they, they grew from that into this out-of-control organization that's exactly. just so and, and, crazy. And it, it, it goes beyond, you know. I, I mean, they, they actually, they were actually fighting a battle for something at that point. They were. And, and, you know, you could have gone with that, but then they didn't. And then there's all this rage, but you idiots are raging against who? A president who's in your favor, a Senate who's in your favor, maybe not the House. Most major cities in America are liberal cities with liberal city councils. So who are you directing your rage against? Because let me tell you something. The growth in government in the last century in this country has been enormous. So I don't know what you're upset about. If you're happy, unhappy that things aren't going the way you think they're going, the way they're supposed to be, all this country has been doing has been following a very liberal path towards growing government, growing the involvement of the state in individual affairs, growing the social state. I don't mean that in a bad sense. 75 years ago, well, actually we're in 2011, yeah, about 80 years ago, the government didn't provide Social Security. So there was no old age pension. There was no Medicare or Medicaid. And it's grown and grown and grown and grown. And you people don't understand the amount of money that's out there for housing assistance, the amount of money that's out there for food assistance. You don't understand that there are kids out there going to college where the federal government is paying $36,000 a year for them to go. And they're only paying $10,000 a year to go get some radio degree at Emerson. Boston uh, University just for next semester, just broke $55,000 oh. a year. And, and there are kids there who the government is paying twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of that. So really, if you're unhappy with the way things are in this country, you need to look at the way things have been done for the last half century and realize maybe it's not the way you want things to do. You may have had good intentions, but it's clearly not working. And by the way, Boston College, not Boston University. I'm sure Boston University is already much higher than that. It wouldn't surprise me, and I mean, pretty. I, I can't wait for the first school to break a hundred grand in terms of their tuition. And you know what? All these universities where you're all upset, and I know I'm going. They, we'll call this my full disclosure editorial for the day. Where you're so upset about the rising cost of tuition, how you can't afford it. Funny, how many conservative schools are there out there? Eh, maybe four, and they're all weird ones. Okay, all the Ivy League schools, all your state schools and universities, state colleges and universities, they're all liberal institutions. So these liberal institutions that you support, that you say you love, you want to be a part of, and then you're raging at the government because you can't afford what they're charging you, why don't you focus on who actually is causing the problems? But I'll end it at that before I turn this into an hour-long episode where I just continue to rant about the left, uh, which we will be hopefully in the next few weeks having a co-host or at least some guest co-host for segments uh, to bring a right-wing perspective, uh, excuse me, to bring a left-wing perspective as we move into politics and as we move into the general election yeah, and I wouldn't call it a change of format as much as going back to the original format that we had for the first show or two before we just got sidetracked by this very interesting GOP political uh, primary season. But now that the GOP primary season is wrapped up in viewpoints mind, I think we could uh, go back to that original format. And I think we are, and I think you're, you'll get another episode from us in two weeks where we will have some guest speakers. And we will be focusing more on general election issues and the candidates as they relate to the general election. I think what we'll do until April 24th rolls around, 
We will focus more on the president. Actually, next week, I'll tell you what, our next Viewpoint episode, episode 12, which will be uh, debuting in about two weeks, is going to focus almost exclusively on President Obama and where he is in his election campaign, where his fundraising is, and some of the issues that are likely to come up. And from there, we're going to go into the issues and then go into the general election battle as the Viewpoint prediction is that the primaries will effectively be over for all intents and purposes after April 24th. That being said, folks, we hope you've enjoyed uh, what will be one of our last primary season coverage episodes, but we're continuing the regular Viewpoint coverage starting in two weeks, and we hope we'll join you then, and we want to thank you for listening to Viewpoint and supporting Viewpoint, as well as all the other base and internet television programming. This is Tony Mizuko, signing off. <laughs>